<laughs> no, no, I've, I've come from the villages. Hello, Africa. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of 1000 African Voices, the Green Energy Edition. And today I'm pleased to introduce to Africa, Mr. Jesse Nyokabi, all the way from Nairobi, Kenya. Jesse will shortly introduce himself. Hi, Jesse. I'm very fine, thank you. How is you? Now doing really well. How are things in Nairobi today? Uh, I think the okay trees today, there was solar the trees. The sun was uh, somehow good. Uh, we have been going up to 10, degree, 10 degrees, and you know, for us now that is what we call winter here because it's too cold for us. We are used to high temperature. Okay, so I said today it's about 10 degrees Celsius. Exactly. Okay, yeah, I think for Nairobi that's a bit cold. Uh, maybe Jesse, before we get started, um, obviously preparing for this show, I got to know about your work a bit more. Uh, but I think for the sake of our listeners, I'll ask that you just maybe expand on what you do, particularly as it relates to, I think you call it uh, pace setting uh, on the green energy front. You can maybe just talk a bit about that. Then we will go back to Nairobi because I'm always fascinated to learn more about where people are from. Uh, but maybe if you can just touch on, uh, I think you call it leadership in the green space. If you can talk a bit about that. Exactly. Yes. Uh, again, my name is Jason Yokabi. I'm currently in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, I do what I love doing. I just like using the word love because I love doing this is uh, exploring on green energy and when I mean exploring on green energy is that we are already doing it but now I also go to the extent of asking myself how do we show the leadership in terms of Africa going out there and showing the leadership in terms of the green energy how can we be innovating we don't have to be like Africa is always consuming on uh, technologies and uh, innovations from other continents we can also show a case that indeed even Africa can be able to come up with their own innovations and uh, show leadership to the rest of the world. So what I do when it comes to green energy is I look at what we are doing currently, but I also ask myself in five years time, in 10 years time, what can we do better? How can we do, do this better? And uh, by doing this, I also try to look at all, the whole life cycle when it comes to green energy. That is. There is the technical part of it, there is the financial part of it, there is the regulatory part of it. And uh, one thing I try to do is uh, try to reach out to each and every other person. But personally, I come from a background of engineering, so when it comes to technical, that is my area. That is where now you find me shining and shining and shining. <laughs> but again, I want to understand what is going on because I can have a brilliant idea, but if the financial models in terms of uh, implementation of this idea doesn't work, my idea becomes another and void. Again, if this like, uh, regulatory and uh, the regulatory framework doesn't support my ideas, again, no matter how brilliant the idea might be, it might not take off. That's why I look at the whole life cycle again. So apart from being the technical guy that I am, I also go exploring on the other areas. So when it comes to green energy, most of the areas that currently have been in is uh, solar, wind, geo and uh, geothermal. So Jesse, what made you want to go into, I mean, there are many things that you, you're touching on, there's leadership, there's wanting to show that Africa cannot just be a consumer, but we need to start creating and innovating. Uh, there's, as I mentioned, leadership, there's green energy, I mean, you are an engineer, you could have easily chosen to stick with that and sort of see out the rest of your 45, 50 year career. What made you decide that you wanted to do more and specifically go into sort of your climate change, it's almost activism, if you can call it that. Uh, what was behind that thought process? Uh, my background being engineering. So I've been trained to give solutions not to just complain and uh, give, uh, just give my thoughts. I, I'm being trained to give innovative solutions to the problem that is ongoing. So one thing I realized is that, yes, we have people who are, uh, I think I would call them now the activists when it comes to climate change and the rest of it. 
But one thing I wanted to go the extra uh, the extra step of okay, there is climate change and it's an issue. So what do we do? What are the innovative uh, innovative solutions that can help us uh, mitigate with the climate change? And uh, one of the best ways was green energy because now when we go to the energy, it will make it that we are coming up with more of the green energy and uh, we are able to innovate in one way or another. We will be able to mitigate climate change. And uh, looking at the uh, other sectors that are uh, looking forward to the energy, such as the uh, transport, they are looking forward to having electric transportation, electric vehicles, uh, aviation is looking at things to do with like green hydrogen. So these are things that are coming on along the way. So they are all depending on, they are coming back to the energy and they are asking, so which energy? There will be no climate mitigation if you don't go to green energy. Because at the end of the day, even if we electrify the transport and the air, we are getting the, the electricity from unrenewable. There is no climate mitigation that will be ongoing. So my motivation was to go the extra step of giving solutions. Okay, I really like that. Yeah. And maybe let's talk then about the energy mix in Kenya specifically. I think it's fair to say uh, in Africa specifically, we still have really reliant on fossil fuels. I think even in the Northern Hemisphere, that picture still remains sort of heavily weighted towards fossil fuels. There's a lot of effort that's been made now to move into this green energy space, but it's something that will take time. How is the, the mix in Kenya? I don't know if you have that information readily available just to get a sense of how much dependence there still is on fossil fuel versus green or renewable energy sources are you seeing an improvement in the energy mix in your country thank you thank you thank you that is a, a good question for me and uh, currently in kenya when you look at the what we uh, we dispatch on the grid more than 93% of the power that is dispatched on the grid is from green energy. That is geothermal, hydro, solar, and wind. In total, what is uh, dispatched on the grid is more than 93%. So for the fossil fuel, it, it only takes about 7%. Wow. Okay. I really didn't know that at all. So over 90% of energy in Kenya is made up of solar, wind, and geothermal energy. Yes, wow. the power that is dispatched on the grid. Wow, that's really impressive. I mean, that is world leading compared to, as I mentioned, most economies. So I think it's fair to say countries that are still struggling in maybe finding the right mix, it may be, uh, may be better to make your way to Nairobi, Kenya, uh, maybe just to get a better understanding of that setup all right we're gonna come back to to the energy bit the work that you're doing i assume that there is some funding that's required for you to continue how is that model like how do you fund your interest as an energy pay setter who's funding all of that like what's the business model if there is any or is it just you purely doing it out of the goodness of your heart Initially, I, uh, initially, I started by doing it out of my own heart and I used to use my own end month salary and uh, from my other income generating projects because it was purely out of my heart. I just wanted to change the world in my own small way. So that's how I started. But along the way, I've gotten a lot of people getting interest every day. I receive a lot of people who want to come in and help me do what I'm doing. So along the way, things are changing. Yes. So I have different people currently who are uh, com coming coming on board in terms of the financing. So currently, I don't use the way I used to use to array my finances from my income generating projects. Hmm. And I suppose in there lies a very good lesson for those who may want to open up new business opportunities. I think most of us never really get started because we keep waiting for capital. But what I'm hearing from your story is when you're passionate about a project or you're passionate about a topic, get started. And if you really believe in what you're doing, 
those who share a common interest will find you on the way and then the funding will come later that that's what i'm hearing from what you're saying which is really good exactly exactly okay i'm one guy who is a very very inspired about changing the world but now i can't go there and just say i'm changing the world i start from where i am in a smaller way but along the way i've found a lot of people who have gotten interest globally that is not just in kenya and africa globally a lot of people and uh very interesting today even sometimes when i'm going for my for my trips in and out of Kenya, sometimes I don't even have to pay because you find like there are even companies that are willing to pay for you to go out and uh, explore what other, other others are doing outside there, then come back to Kenya and uh, ask myself from the problems that you have in Kenya, what lesson can we pick from outside there, but we brand with what is happening in Kenya and come up with something that is very innovative. Hmm. And the, the legislative framework within Kenya, do you find that it supports maybe small businesses, first of all, and secondly, innovation? I mean, having been to different parts of the world, how do you think Kenya compares against other jurisdictions in terms of the legislative framework? Okay. Uh, uh, when it comes to the regulatory framework, eh? For Kenya, I can say it's very progressive, that it's very supportive. What we are really uh, uh, lagging behind is in terms of innovation. Most of the time, you find like the government would want something that has been tested and proven that is working. But again, I'm one person who is saying we are, we, we are now in a continent whereby Africa should also be innovative and giving solutions to problems and others coming and learning from Africa. So that is one thing when it comes to innovation that we, I can say we are still lagging behind. But when it comes to the regulatory framework, we are more than, we are more than doing okay. Hmm. I, I like that you keep going back to the fact that Africa needs to, to start innovating and setting the benchmark. For when it comes to most technologies, yes, the Western world is a leader and has been a leader for centuries. But there are things that are very new where everyone is learning at the same time, whether that's climate change or just digital technology. And there's no excuse or reason why as Africa, we cannot lead the world in that aspect. I mean, if you just think about mobile tech, without a doubt, Africa leads in that space. So why can we not apply the same level of thinking and innovativeness to other aspects of the economy? So I really like that and I hope people will join the movement, Jesse, so that we can have more of you, not only in Kenya, but across our beautiful continent. One of the major problems that I've seen, and I think it's not only in Kenya, but most of the sub-Saharan African nations, is that uh, the problem we have is the no political goodwill when it comes to innovation. Because sometimes you look at the way the regulatory frameworks are being debated in the in the kind of like a, the parliament and you find that like they are not seeing the future. They are just seeing it today. So they are not giving us that morale of, yes, we need to go that innovation way. And uh, I wish we were given that political goodwill. I think for most of the young people in Africa, we will be already be there. We will be already ready. And when it comes to financing and the rest, we get it will get us along the way. But all we need is the political goodwill. It will get us along the way. Absolutely, political goodwill, political support. Unfortunately, as uh, maybe business people or innovators, without that fertile ground that is set, unfortunately, by politicians or political leaders, it does become a challenge. And we have seen the benefit of a progressive government, um, your country being a really good example. Uh, I think under President Kenyatta, there's been a lot of progress. Yes, I'm sure there are things that can improve, but from my perspective, very progressive policies. You go across to Rwanda, you get the same sense. And I'm happy to see that even in the likes of Tanzania, we're starting to see uh, that level of progression. So that's really encouraging to see. And hopefully we'll get a lot more of that across the continent uh, so that we can start shaping the continent that we want, uh, particularly as, I suppose, relatively young people 
it's up to us to shape this continent into what we want it to be. Uh, Jesse, I'll be remiss if I don't talk about Kenya, its people, the food. Uh, I'm always curious to understand uh, how Jesse's life in Nairobi is like. Do you mind just sharing a bit with our listeners and viewers the life of a young person in Nairobi? What are some of the things that you, you get up to? If I were to find myself in Nairobi, where should I go? What kind of things should I be looking out for? Yeah, sure. Mm, the life, when it comes to Nairobi, the life is uh, a very interesting life. I believe you know that uh, Nairobi city is one of the only, I think it's the only city in Africa that has a game park at the capital city. Yeah, it's the yeah. only nation in Africa. So this is a very interesting city. I can tell you, a very interesting city because you never get lost and there is a lot to get fun about. And uh, now, apart from uh, all that work, when now you are free, I'm a free man. Most of the time, I like going to different adventure, such as uh, going to different forests that are within the and uh, within the Nairobi metropolitan and uh, visiting game park, such. And uh, one thing that you cannot want to miss in Nairobi is the Nyamachoma. That is the only thing that you never miss that one when you come to Nairobi. <laughs> That is one of the best. Well, the meat has been, uh, I don't know what you, you call choma. It is not frying and it is that burning with the fire itself. It's very one of the things that you should never miss in Nairobi. Okay, so maybe for those who are not familiar with Nyama Choma, so you're referring to the Americans will call it a barbecue in Southern yeah. Africa. It's like a braai. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I know there's quite a lot of goat meat uh, in Nairobi specifically, but when you're talking about Yamachoma, your face lights up. Is it really that good? Uh, is it worth making the trip to to Nairobi just for that? I, can, I that's one I can I, I can tell you I can guarantee you that is one thing you never want. I think that's the one thing that you will always be in your memory forever and ever about Nairobi. <laughs> okay, yeah. To be honest, I can attest. Uh, I have two memories of uh, Nairobi. One is exactly that Nyama Choma at 3 in the morning. Yes, 3 a.m. and you can go out and have your Nyama Choma. The second is the thing they're called the Matatus, the colorful buses. Uh, what's okay. up with that? Uh, is there some kind of competition happening in Nairobi to have the best looking, most colorful bus? Uh, yes, and you know now, again, now, uh, the way you see them, they are very colorful. The way you, they have been, uh, their aesthetic are so much and uh, it's very expensive. Eh? Also, remember that when it comes to fair, it will also be much more expensive compared to the rest. So, it is, they have their own category of customers that uh, they target. So, not everyone else will be going to it because sometimes they charge double what is uh, oh, wow. being charged by the rest. Oh, yes. okay. No, I didn't yes, know yes. that so at all. They have their market. Oh, nice. Okay. It sounds like I know most people who come to Nairobi regard it as one of the best environments anywhere in the world. Most people say, oh, my favorite place is definitely Kenya. And I've thought about why that is the case. And having had the privilege of hosting this show and making my way to Kenya, there's a level of vibrancy that you get, whether you're Nairobi, Mombasa, the energy that's in Kenya is you don't find that anywhere else in the world. I still don't know what the reason for that is, uh, but it's really something that if you can afford to travel to Nairobi, I would really encourage that you do that. Uh, maybe so it's Nyama Choma, the Matatus. Maybe you can do one last thing, then we'll we'll get back to the green energy bit. Yeah, sure, sure. And another thing is that uh, you know what most people love about uh, love about coming to Kenya. When you come to Kenya, the people in Kenya are very welcoming. You don't feel like you are visiting. You feel like you are just one of them, and uh, you are very quick to bread with almost everyone that is surrounding you. And you know we treat each other like for when, especially when it comes to Africa, we treat each other like he's just one one of us. And uh, is, yeah. In fact, most of, most of the time when you come to Nairobi and you know someone, 
I can, you can rest assured you visit a lot of places because they will take you even out of Nairobi to Naivasha. They will take you to our Jyothamo, Jyothamo Spa in uh, Naivasha and uh, other areas. And uh, I think it is worth it, very worth it. No, absolutely. I know most of us, we think of, when you think Kenya, we think, that's how I'm wearing this, you think running, uh, but I can assure you there's a lot more to it than that. But it's it's great to dominate the world in long distance running. I don't know if you do any running at all. I don't want to assume. Uh, myself, no. I, I, I'm not an athlete. <laughs> all right, cool. Jesse, so the, the green energy landscape, it's something that you started out of passion. You're starting to see and watch it grow. Uh, where are you going with it? Maybe in the medium to long term, what is it that you you want to see? And I assume once you're done with Kenya, I assume you've got ambitions to take your passion uh, broader, whether it's East Africa or the entire continent. Maybe in your words, what's your medium to long term uh, goal or objectives? One of my major long term goal, that is medium to long term goal, is uh, I want just to not just confine myself to Kenya. I want now to go outside Africa. In fact, I've now started more going to Africa and uh, joining more, more of the kind of uh, professional organization outside Kenya so that they can also try to learn what others are doing outside Kenya. And uh, one of the things I am looking forward to see is uh, I'm looking forward to see these innovations now coming out very clearly and we are able to show the rest of the rest of the uh, world that we are doing something. We are not just there, we are doing something. And uh, one of the things like uh, recently I did was uh, I showcased a model we did on our geothermal well using machine learning and we were able to predict from temperature and pressure of our wellhead, we were able to predict the amount of power that will be going to the grid. And the rest of the world were, oh, so something like this, that like African can be able, Africans can be able to do something great like this. They're able to do the model themselves and the, the, until to the point they're able to tell you the amount of power that is, is going on the grid. Because initially, these models, are done by expatriates who are brought into the country to come and do this model for us. But now as we have gone the extent of even making it that we are using the artificial intelligence and we are able to do this and we showed the world, we showed the world through a presentation and the rest of the world was kind of, these guys are doing it. And uh, this is what I'm saying. We need to show the rest of the world because I know we are doing, I can tell you we are doing a lot. And uh, I know a lot of people who are doing a lot of innovation, but the problem is that we don't showcase our ideas to the rest of the world. So people are still having this mentality of Africa. When you hear Africa is a black, uh, uh, they like telling me it's a black continent. People are dying of hunger. There is no infrastructure, but they, that is not the truth. And I can tell you out of experience, I've gone even to other countries. That is not true. We are doing it and we are doing it. The best thing is that we have made the first step. We are not there, but we are doing it. So let us also showcase. Another thing that I'm looking for is where now the rest of the Africa will come together and start asking ourselves, when it comes to financing of green energy, I think Africa is the most affected continent when it comes to financing. Because most of the international lenders and uh, investors they are, they, are, they are always concerned about the political scenario when it comes to Africa. So most of our financial models are affected and uh, we find like the green energy is very expensive in Africa. Yet it is supposed to be very affordable, but we end up having a very expensive financial model. But this is because of the political and the rest of the things like we are always told Africa is very corrupt and such things. But again, if the Africa as a continent can come together through the African Development uh, Bank and ask ourselves, how can we how can we come up with our own financial model that will be able to get the African terrain when it comes to investing in green energy? And uh, I thank God I have been uh, into a training under the African Development Bank. I'm in talk with most of the people who work in African Development Bank. And we are exploring on ways we can now bring the whole Africa together to discuss how do we go about this? Because that is one thing that is really delaying green energy investment in Africa. 
And I think you can say that about many other projects. And I'm glad you touched on the, the issue of showcasing what's happening. One of the reasons we exist as 1000 African Voices is to shape our narrative, uh, waiting for the Western media to tell our story. For me, that's completely outdated. So we need to see podcasts, television programs for Africa by Africans growing so that we can showcase the work that is happening across because you're right there's amazing work happening in ethiopia around innovation there's great work happening in cape town south africa silicon dye in tanzania all of that needs to be showcased but for us to have something to showcase people like yourself need to be in the forefront leading this change that we all want to see so i i couldn't agree with what you're saying more uh, maybe just see as we're about to to wrap up i'm um, wondering if there may be things that you want to share with our viewers that maybe we do not have time to get into i'm happy for you to really leave something with our viewers and listeners uh, so that uh, not only will they remember nyama choma but they will remember jess in your gavi and all the amazing work that you guys are doing yeah sure sure i wanted to talk of something uh, in one of the international uh, international group that is uh, related to green energy that I'm in, they like referring to me as uh, the humming the hummingbird. I don't know if you have ever heard of that story, the hummingbird. They always refer to me as the humming uh, hummingbird. The reason is because I always tell them what I'm doing might be a, uh, might be something very small, but what I'm doing is my best. I'm giving the best to the world. And that's why you find like now, most of the people now, they want to come in because they believe this young man is doing something and uh, he has proven the ordinary reasonable doubt that he's doing it. So one thing I like telling young people and uh, most of my mentees is that you have to start the first step. Nobody will come where you are sitting. You have to make that first step. Then along the way, things will fall. Don't ask how, but they will still fall. So you have to be the hummingbird, whereby you have to do the best you can. You might be the smallest in the room, you might be the, the most small person in the room, but at the end of the day, your best is what you will come with. And I'm always very proud to study in for Africa. Nowadays, I talk about a lot about Africa. If you have realized the name Africa is almost coming more times even more than Kenya because I'm very passionate about Africa and I'm, I'm telling you since 2015 up to last year, 2020, most of my work has been at, under the confinement of Kenya. But since the starting of this year, I've tried to go out and see what other countries are doing. And I've made a lot of friends from Nigeria, a lot of friends from uh, Rwanda. I have a lot a lot of friends from Zimbabwe, uh, Tanzania, Uganda. At least now, I can tell you even virtually, I am able to know exactly what is happening where. In South Africa, I have so many friends. I think most of my friends are from South Africa because we have uh, worked with them previously. In 2018, we worked with them where we were defending solar and wind uh, when it was under some attack from uh, the non-renewable area. So we worked with them and uh, from there we made a lot of friends. I made a lot of friends. And what you're touching on is we idolize countries like America, but what we forget is you're talking about an amalgamation of 50 states. Then we also like to talk about China and all the good work that they are doing. You forget that you're talking about 1.3, 1.4 billion people who've come together to form this thing called China. And you can say the same thing with India and their massive population. The division of Africa into the 54 states, in my opinion, is disadvantageous because you've got now these small populations divided across the continent. I imagine an Africa where we ultimately come together, where whether you're from Kenya, Malawi, those things at some point have to stop to matter. But before we get there, collaboration such as what you've outlined now is one of the solutions that we can implement today. And the more of those we have, then the greater the chance of Africa being a prosperous continent are uh, so i could not agree with you more jesse uh, on that note um 
do hope to come back to Nairobi and I always invite our listeners and viewers to make your way to Nairobi. If you're feeling a bit more relaxed, maybe go across to Mombasa. Uh, but having that wildlife right in the middle of Nairobi, it's a very unique experience. So if you can, please uh, do make your way to East Africa. Mr. Jesse Nyokabi, I do wish you well in all your endeavors. We'll be watching this space. And I'm pretty sure our viewers today will remember this name, Jesse Nyokabi. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for hosting me and uh, giving me this talk, especially to talk to the rest of the African children. Personally, I mean, I mean to see that Africa shines. Thank you.